We are in Daniel chapter 3. We read the first half of it last week. And so let me summarize for you what went on is that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, this, this is actually taking place in the 18th year of his reign. And in the 18th year of his reign, it is right after he has finished the third conquest of Jerusalem. The first conquest he just took some of the nobility's children back to Babylon after establishing a puppet government. The second attack, he took about 10,000 artisans. And the third attack from that rebellious city, which which it was referred to, he actually uh, uh, destroyed the city, just burned it to the ground, and took masses of people. So Daniel and his three friends had been there now for a little over 18 years. They were well established. Daniel now was... was, uh, a uh, leader in the province of Babylon, of course, under Nebuchadnezzar, but a very high position. He was also uh, 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 president of the Bible college there, and uh, uh, the, the, the university there, which wasn't just, wasn't just uh, the religious center, it was, uh, it was actually the scholarly center, and it was also uh, um, uh, the, the, the college that, that studied astrology, and that and it studied science. So it was really a, a really a powerful position. So his three friends are invited, along with all the other magistrates and, and, and royal officials, they're invited to the dedication of a big, um, uh, a, a, a big image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar had built. It was 90 feet high, and it was, uh, um, it was 9 feet wide. So nine feet wide, but 90 feet high on the plains of Dura, which is right outside uh, of Babylon there. And they're invited to this. And when all the magistrates and all these visitors are coming, all the, the, the officials of the city come, then he announces that not only is this a dedication, but you're going to have to worship this, this, uh, this idol that is here. And, they, and the command was, when you hear the music, you have to fall down and worship. So the music was played and everybody fell down except three men. That's Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, the three friends of Daniel, were, were, were not worshipping. Where Daniel was, we are not sure. Maybe he was also not bowing down, but the, 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 uh, uh, the Chaldeans were afraid to, to accuse him because of his high position. Or maybe he just flat out wasn't there. Or maybe Nebuchadnezzar didn't want him to be put in the position of having to do this because Nebuchadnezzar thought so much of him. Nebuchadnezzar did not think as much of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego because they're not the ones who had interpreted his dream 16 years earlier, but they were appointed upon Daniel's request. And so that takes us to where we are now. And so it says, let's pick it up again in verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and they said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. So they come and they accuse, and it says specifically the, the Chaldeans, which are the locals, have now come against this, the, these three men. It's very obvious they're not bowing down and everybody else is bowing down. And they said, there are certain Jews among you. They didn't just say there are certain men among you. They specifically said there are certain Jews among you. So you see the anti-Semitism right there. And, and he says that they disregard you, which is not the case. They serve very well under the king. They don't disregard him. But in this, they could not follow. And he says, and they don't serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up, which is true. So Nebuchadnezzar, it says in verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, that, is it true Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up. Verse 15, Now if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? So he gives them actually a second chance. He had said, he had made a decree, whoever doesn't bow down is going to get thrown in there. But he's giving them a second chance. So he must have thought well of them. The other reason we know he thinks well of them is because he addresses them by name. He says, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? So he must have known them, even though they said the names. Why would he know them? Yeah, they said the three names, but if somebody says to you three names and you're king, you don't necessarily pay, pay much attention to the names. Plus, he's giving them a second chance here. Now, this trial is very different than their former trial. The former trial, which happened to them uh, 16 years earlier, or, or, or 15 years earlier, was that the king said that he was going to kill every wise man in Babylon because no one was able to give him the, tell him the dream nor the interpretation of it. In that, there was no decision to be made for the Lord. All they could do was cry out for the Lord, Lord, save us, give us the understanding, and then God granted the understanding to Daniel. But in this one, there's a choice. There is a clear choice. You can either fall down in worship, or you're going to die. You can either put aside your religious constraints, or you are going to die. So now there's a decision to be made. Before there was no decision. They were all going to die if they didn't come up with some explanation here. In this case, they can lay down their religious, uh, 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 their, their religious restraints here and they can worship this idol or they're going to die. So this is a different kind of trial. There are some trials that come upon our lives that we have no choice in. It just comes upon us. And there are other trials that come upon us based on a decision that's put before us. Which side will we go toward? Will we go toward that which is right? Or will we take that which is expedient? That which is easy and gets us through the problem. If we tell a small lie, does it get us through the problem? And then we don't have to address it anymore. Or do we stand our ground and do that which we know to be right? So, in verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So they say to him, we don't need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Now, that's not, that's not given back to the king to be, to, be, uh, uh, to be rude or to be crass in any way. He says the decision's already been made. Remember, the decision was made long before they ever got in this situation. He's saying to them, you, O king, know. You know our lives. This is not something that we can do. There's no decision to be made. I'll give you an example of this. Just recently, a young man came to me, with a, and he, he was a former Rice student, and he's gone off to graduate school. And, uh, um, and he met a young lady at graduate school, and he wanted me to meet her, and they, and they came back to visit. And, and uh, um, they were thinking of getting engaged, and they wanted my thoughts on this. I said, you know, tell me about your parents. How do your parents feel? Because I never want to go against parents' will because your parents love you more than I will ever love you because they are your parents. And your parents have an ability to know what is good for you even if they are, un uh, they are unbelievers. God has given them this. This is why God specifically told you and me to honor our parents. This is in the Old Testament. This is in the New Testament. We are to honor our mother and our father. So he said, tell me how your parents feel. They said, all are okay except the young lady's dad, who is not a believer. He wants her to wait until she finishes her graduate school. She's in graduate school right now. And, uh, and he says, I said, so what are you going to do? He says, well, we're praying about it. I said, you don't have to pray. You don't have to pray. 
You just have to obey the word of God. You are going to honor your mother and your father. You are not going to get engaged until she is done with graduate school. That's what the father wants. It's not a matter of prayer. You don't pray about obeying the word of God. You pray about your heart obeying the word of God, but you don't pray about whether you're going to obey the word of God or not. You pray about your own heart getting in in conformity with the word of God. The scriptures are true. We don't pray about whether we're going to obey what it says. This is what they're talking about. This is not an issue where we have to sit around and, and, and think, well, are we going to do it or aren't we? The decision's already been made. This is why, as we discussed last week, you make decisions for your life long before you get in those situations. If you haven't made a decision how far you're going to go in your relationship physically, young ladies with men and men with young ladies, if you haven't made a decision, when you're in the throes of the moment, it is very hard to all of a sudden come up with a decision of how far you are going to go. In prayer, long before the relationship ever develops, you make a decision. You make a decision now. Because remember, there are people who care nothing about your destiny. Nothing about what God has planned for you for the future. That only want to fulfill their own physical desires and will throw that back at you. If you love me, you will do this. Which is totally wrong. Because remember, if this word, if this thought, if this action is not in the other's best interest, it is not the love of God. The decision is made long before you're in the throes of the physical moment. And this is why when you're getting into a relationship, you be clear. You have a discussion. This is who I am as a believer. If the person's not a believer, you don't have to pray about whether this relationship is of God or not. If the person is not a believer, it is not the will of God. We know that because the scriptures tell us we should not be unequally yoked. So it's not a matter of prayer. It's a matter of obedience. But if both of you know the Lord, you have to establish ground rules to begin with. And if that person is so immature that they're uncomfortable with establishing ground rules, that's an indication this is probably not the right person. And if it is the right person, now's not the right time. The person's got to grow up a little bit in their faith. This is what it's talking about. There are decisions that are made. We don't even need to pray about this, Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, we can't do this. And God's going to deliver us out of your hands, but even if He doesn't. So in other words, there was a great faith and a great confidence, but there was not a presumption that God was going to protect them. Because they don't know. God may have them die as martyrs. Many men and women have burned at the stake. And continue to this day to be burned at the stake because of their testimony of Jesus. This happens. And it's happening more so even today. So these things do happen. So in verse 19, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, so we've seen this man. This monarch has these, you know, he goes into these fits of rage. Uh, whoever doesn't fall down in worship is going to be thrown into the furnace. Before that, it was whoever does not do this is going to be torn limb from limb and his house will be made a rubbish heap, which means a public, uh, a public latrine. This is what he's talking about. This is, this is, this, we've seen this characteristic. And it says his facial expression changed, which means that he's reasoning with these guys. He, he liked them. They were serving in his kingdom. But now, you know, the guy's getting violent. And Daniel tells us in Daniel chapter 5, actually, Daniel says, you're speaking about Nebuchadnezzar to Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. He says, your father, whatever he wanted, happened. If he wanted people killed, they were killed. So we know it. So this guy didn't mess around. And he says he, he answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes, and they were cast into the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was so urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. So, 
it says that, that he ordered, he ordered the furnace to be heated uh, seven times more than it was usually heated. Now, re- remember, the furnaces were about 20 feet high, and so they were, they were spherical. And at the top, there, was a, there would be an earthen ramp built up toward the top where they would drop the things in. So it came up, and they would drop things in there. And at the base, there was a small opening where once the furnace had gone out, they could go in and just clean out the junk. But all the fuel was thrown in at the top. That's the way these furnaces were. He asked that it be heated to seven times more than normal. Now, if any of you are studying materials science, you understand what this means. You can't take a material and bring it to seven times its normal usage capacity and have it survive. So these people, so if you throw in, say, one cord of wood normally, you have to throw in seven cords of wood. This is going to be blazing hot, way beyond its normal capacity. So they're throwing in seven times more fuel than normally. Because the king just said seven. Well, you've got to do seven times then. So this is so stressed from a materials standpoint that it, it's just way beyond its capacity of what it was made to handle. Seven times more than it was, it wasn't one and a half times, it wasn't doubled. It said seven times. The scriptures tell us seven times because that's what he said. So you better do it or else the king might throw us in too. Just throw it in. Don't. So they throw in all this fuel and it's just so blazing hot. Now if the king really wanted to hurt these guys, he wouldn't do this because they're going to die so fast now. At least they suffer a little bit before. But now it's so blazing hot that he's going to throw them in there like this. And so they are tied up. So they're, they're tied fast, which means their hands, their feet, they're all tied up. And so he has to get at least six men, because two men per person, to carry them up. There's six, at least six of his valiant men. It doesn't say how many of his valiant men. And they have to bring them up to the top. And there's an enormous amount of heat coming out. Remember, the heat doesn't so radiate from the bottom. It comes out the top, that top opening, where you add the fuel. In this case, the fuel being, being uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And so they bring them up. The first two bring them up. And they have to drop them in because they're all tied up. So maybe one carrying the feet, one carrying from, from the shoulders. And they're dropping them in. They have to get close themselves in order to be able to drop them in. But the heat is so intense, those men fall. And they're probably caught fire and they're, they're rolling down this ramp. And then the other two coming up are like, uh-oh. <laughs> but these are valiant men. They're going to obey the king. They go up and they catch fire too as they drop the second one in. And imagine the, the last pair of guys. That, and and, and they, they get caught on fire too because the heat is so extreme. It's made way more than this was ever made to handle. So these three are, are thrown into the midst of the, the burning fire, the blazing fire. Now in verse 24, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded, and he stood up in haste. And he said to his officials, Was it not three men that we cast into the midst of the fire? And they replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire and he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on their bodies of of these men, nor was their hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses shall be reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no God who is able to deliver it this way. 
Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. And so, there was no burning of those three Hebrew nationals. You can tell this is a Gentile audience. <laughs> um, what he teaches us through the scriptures is that, is that uh, he, he teaches against idolatry. He teaches against idolatry. That even when you are in, in, uh, under this time of the Gentiles, which we still live under, the world is dominating by this time of the Gentiles until the second return of Jesus. He warns them against idolatry. And he tells Jews that are living under Gentile dominance, you can assimilate without becoming like the people. This is what he's teaching them. They are going to reach into top positions This is what he's showing by this. They're going to reach into top positions. And all over the world, you will find Jews not running countries, but they are in top positions financially and politically. All over the world, in countries all over the world. And that while they're in these positions, there is going to be hatred against them and jealousy against them, such that people will want to destroy them for their high positions. And we see that happening throughout the world. And that also a remnant of faithful Jews will always survive during the reign of the Gentiles. This is what he's teaching them through this. But this is, this is what, what they've done. And so Nebuchadnezzar even praises them. It says in, in verse uh, 28, praises them for violating the king's command and yielding up their bodies. He actually praised them for violating his own command. And so we see this. So what is our... What, what, what do we have to do as believers with respect to government authorities? Let's turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 tells us what our role is in this. Romans chapter 13 verse 1 in the New Testament it tells us every person is to be subject to governing authorities for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause for fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have the praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what's evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So if we just read this verse, we would say that we need to live in subjection to governing authorities. Turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2 also speaks to this. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Reading from verse 1, it says, For all... First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So, he tells us that we are to pray for governing officials, even the officials that we don't like. In this time, when this was written in the New Testament, Governing officials were the Roman government. They are being told, still pray for them so that you may live in a peaceful time. Well, is there a time when we as believers should go against governing authorities? And there are, are three things where, where we're told to go against governing authorities. And the first one is when there is the protection of imminent human life. And we know that. We have seen it in the scriptures. The midwives... In, in, uh, in Egypt, were told to throw the newborn boys into the Nile. They were told to do that. The newborn baby boys of the Jews, they were throw, told to throw into the Nile that, that only the, the, uh, the females could live. It says that those women disobeyed the command of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh blessed them for disobeying the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them homes and he established them as a result. When there is the protection of imminent human life. The second one is in preaching the gospel. We see this in the New Testament. Peter and John are called in. They are told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And they didn't say, oh yes, we will obey governing authorities. No, they continued to go out preaching in the name of Jesus. So there is a, 
there's an, we are encouraged to undergo civil disobedience when it's for the protection of imminent human life, when it comes to preaching of the gospel. And then thirdly, to accept and worship the Lord. So in other words, if the government says nobody can accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, that is something that we are instructed in the Scriptures to oppose. Those are the three instances, acceptance and worship of the Lord. Those are the three instances. Some believers feel that, oh, we shouldn't have to pay taxes, and so they don't want to pay taxes, or they'll, they'll, they'll uh, uh, cheat on their income tax, justifying them, themselves. But there is no such justification in Scripture. Even if you think the taxes are too much, you're to pay taxes. You need to obey the speed limits and the traffic laws, whether we, are told, whether we feel that they should be obeyed or not. We are told to obey governing authorities, except in these areas we have precedent in the Scripture, where by disobedience there is blessing. So, so uh, uh, there are things that, that come at us as believers. In the Scriptures, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, God instructs Israel in three specific things. He teaches them about humility. He says there are things you're going to undergo in your life and I'm doing this to keep you humble. Humility. And he taught them uh, 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 spirituality. There are things that Israel had to do so that they would remain close to God. There were issues of spirituality. And I'll give you an example in our own lives. Jesus has freed us from the laws of Moses. We, we're not under the 613 commandments of Moses. Thank goodness we're not. But we are under certain things. There are things, practices that we take up. For example, in, in Hebrews 10.25, it says, Don't neglect the fellowship of the saints, which is the habit of some, but gather together, and all the more as the day draws near. So we are told to come together. There are Christian gatherings. For example, going to church on Sunday. There are spiritual things that we do that keep us close in our relationship with God. There are practices that we take, and in my family, we take this very seriously. We have four children, and the children have never, in our entire married lives, we've been married 33 years, and my oldest child is 31, we have never missed church because of a sick child. Never. Sometimes one of us would stay home with the sick child, and the other would take the other children, and we would go to church. For us, it was very important. It was a matter of obedience to the Scriptures where we were going to gather together. So we didn't miss church. We did this sort of thing, and this was the practice that we had. There are certain practices we take upon ourselves. My time in the morning with the Lord. I will always spend time in the, in the morning reading the Scriptures and spending time in the Lord. There are some days where I have to be in an airport at 4 a.m., well, then I'll get to the airport by 4 a.m., and then but my Bible's in my hand, and I'm going to start reading the Scriptures while I'm sitting on an airplane. But there is going to be a morning time with the Lord. This is something that I do. There's this is spiritual aspects around this. And the third thing in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that he challenges them with is you've got to have faith. So you, you have to walk in humility. There are issues of spirituality, and there are issues of faith. This is what he put upon them. But there was a sequence of three kings in the nation of Israel that just totally threw them off. Solomon. Solomon was a man of unbridled passions, though he was greatly gifted. The unbridled passions of a gifted man can be his utter downfall. The unbridled passions of a gifted man. This happens to so many believers the unbridled passions of gifted people, where the gifts of God have been poured out upon a person, but there's, there are unbridled passions that come upon them. And they don't take care to leave those in check. There are certain parameters that we put on our lives to keep us out of trouble. I was saying last week, to this day, a young woman does not come in my office, a woman of any age does not come in my office without the door being open. And my secretary knows that if somebody walks in and it's a woman walks in my office and shuts the door behind them, they're to get up and open the door. Because I don't want even the appearance of evil. And I've been married 33 years and I'm a lot older than my students. But still, I don't want to be alone in an office with a female. 
This is a practice that I have. I don't want to be alone in an apartment with a woman. If I go to somebody's house and the husband isn't home, I don't want to go in that house and sit in that house alone with their wife. I just don't want to do it. And I've seen other Christian men, and I know that, and I come home and they're waiting outside my house. And, and I say, why don't you go in? Say, I'd rather wait out here till you get home. And I know exactly what they're talking about. I understand this. There are parameters. It's not that Scripture dictates this. It's that we dictate for our own lives. I'm not putting this upon you. I'm telling you what I do for my own life. Because I don't want my passions to be unbridled. Unbridled passions of a gifted person have led to their destruction over and over again. I have seen it and I'm seeing it now. I have seen it in CEOs of companies that get all this power, all this prestige, and everybody is looking at them. And they end up falling into other relationships. It destroys their family. They end up moving in with other women, and that destroys their family. And now it's like they're the secret laughing stock of the whole company. They've gone from this high position where everybody admired them, these huge companies that they have built, and all this admiration, and now they're the laughing stock because of unbridled passions. There are decisions that we make that guard our lives. Decisions that you have to make to guard and protect your life. Because unbridled passions will destroy you. Rehoboam came after, after Solomon, that Solomon's son. He had the uh, uh, wanton power of a weak man. That man wanted power so much and he was a weak man. And it led to his downfall. And the third one was Jeroboam. Jeroboam had an unteachable temperament in a privileged man. This man was given so much, a privileged man, but he had this unteachable temperament. If you ever get to the point where you think, I don't need that, that sort of Christian, I don't need to hear what the pastor is saying, you have a deep problem. If you have ever risen to the point to think that you don't need others to be speaking into your life, you are so deceived. That shows you need others speaking into your life. We all need others speaking into our lives. You say, well, I, I, I know the Bible better than he does. Well, then obey the Scriptures. And follow the teachings of those over you in the church. Because we have to have a teachable spirit. And those three men in succession took the northern and the southern kingdom just into total disarray and just sent them just, just worshiping idols in total disarray. This unteachable temperament. We all need to be taught. We all need to have instruction coming into our lives. And there are things that we need and parameters that we need around our lives. These men made the decision to follow their Lord. This man, he says, Nebuchadnezzar says, I see one like one of the son of the gods walking around with them. This could well have been a physical manifestation of Jesus. He didn't know exactly what it was. In fact, in the, in the end of, of, of Daniel chapter 3, he talks about how, how an angel was sent. So he refers to him as an angel, which is very much in keeping with, with uh, Babylonian polytheism, polytheistic theology, that there were angels. So he says who has sent his angel and delivered his servants. So you see, the men are living in the midst of a dominance of people who, who don't care much for them, and still they are following the Lord. And Jesus calls us. Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 4, we'll close with this. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to close with Matthew chapter 4. And the devil comes to Jesus three times. And on the third as listed in Matthew, which is probably not the third because Luke has a different order, and, and, uh, um, uh, but in any case, it, and Luke is the one that we know is the one in chronological order, but he says this, he says in, in verse 8, And the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The enemy presents to Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. 
and says, all of this I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It is only in the worship of God that you will be fulfilled and the service of him. Only in the worship and service of him that you will be fulfilled. If you expect that young man that you marry to fully fulfill you, you will be totally heartbroken. Because no person can fully fulfill you. If you expect that young woman and think that, wow, if I had that woman, I would be totally fulfilled. I wouldn't need another thing. You will be heartbroken. You will be totally discouraged. Because no person can totally fulfill you. It is God and God alone and in the worship of Him. Jesus said it is in the worship of Him and the service of Him. And that's why Jesus points this out in John chapter 12. He says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever comes to me, whoever serves me shall come to me. Where I am, there shall my servant also be. And whoever serves me, the Father will honor him. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor him. There is service. In the service of Jesus, there is great blessing. Only in that will you be fulfilled. It is only in that that you will find fulfillment. We need to make decisions like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. There are things that we will not do as believers. And you decide what that will be. By this time, in Babylon, there were thousands upon thousands of Jews. Probably over 100,000. Because in the second one, he took 10,000 artisans. So this, there were hundreds of thousands of Jews. There were only three standing. There were only three standing. So most of them had had just submitted to this thing. But Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, we make decisions to worship and to follow God, to follow His ways. And in that, you will be fulfilled. There's fulfillment only in that. If your passions are not bridled, there will be great destruction in your lives. And I have seen it many, many times. Good young people that have gotten older and older and then made decisions because of unbridled passions that have brought great destruction in their lives. You make decisions and you walk in them as these men did. Let's pray. Abba Father, I thank you so much for the truth of your word. And I pray, Lord, for the empowering of these young people to make decisions for their lives, for their physical bodies, for their spiritual welfare, that they would grow in the knowledge of You. Father, I pray that they would take upon themselves decisions which will guard and protect their lives so they will understand what it means to be fulfilled in worship and in service of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for those here who do not know You, O oh Lord, open up their hearts this day, I pray, and draw them to Jesus. Turn them, O oh Lord, over to Jesus. Father, I pray that they would bow their hearts and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me because I am a sinner and come into my life. Father, I pray that even this day you will draw one in our midst to Jesus, even this day. They would, they would say, Lord Jesus, Forgive me because I am a sinner and come into my life. Father, cover and protect these young people, I pray. Cover and protect them. The grace of God surround them. May your mercies fill them. In the name of Jesus. If you like the content that's coming out on this channel, I've not monetized it in the sense of advertising, but if you want to give and you want to help support it, You can give to a 501c3 so it's fully tax deductible and you can see the link below. We'd love to have your participation and there's several mechanisms by which you could give. Thank you.